What is up, y'all? This is CK here with Ansel doing a little bonus show of FedWatch. Uh, the interview that we just recorded with Stacy Herbert uh, was so action-packed and it was so dense that we didn't want it to end. And it just kind of got so long that we said, hey, it deserves its own show. So we're taking our normal uh, Fed updates and macro updates and putting them into this bonus show. Before we get into the show and talk about everything that happened in the last couple of weeks uh, in all things macro, let's talk about our newest sponsor. So this show is brought to you by one of the coolest companies in the Bitcoin space, and that is Paxful. Paxful is an extremely underrated P2P marketplace. Uh, it is a way for people to buy Bitcoin and sell Bitcoin for almost any other trading pair. Uh, they have almost every single currency trading pair with Bitcoin, as well as tons of different gift cards. Um, and Paxful is just absolutely necessary trading infrastructure for you know people in underbanked countries, in places that don't have access to a traditional bank system, don't have access to the dollar. They're using Paxful for remittances. They're using Paxful for trade because Paxful has such an incredible network that enable this P2P commerce. I've spoken to their CEO, Ray Youssef, multiple times. Uh, in my opinion, just such an outstanding leader in the space, such a philanthropist, uh, huge fan of what he's built at Paxful, huge fan of Paxful. Can't recommend them enough and super excited to have them supporting Bitcoin Magazine podcasts. Uh, head over to Paxful.com backslash podcast today uh, to learn more about them to get started contributing to their P2P Bitcoin ecosystem uh, and to participate in the future of finance. Yes, uh, Bitcoin Dictionary is now published in paperback finally. So you guys Let's can go. find that on amazon.com. It's uh, or, you know, short link is bitcoindictionary.cc. That'll take you to the listing on Amazon. I'm, I'm pretty excited for it. It's uh, again, it's been a long time coming. Been working on it for, um, you know, off and on for a year and a half. So this is a pretty exciting day for me. I am buying the paperback right now. I just added it to my cart. So nice. it's that easy. I'm excited. I had the Kindle version, but you know, I feel like with the dictionary, the tape, like the paper version makes a lot of sense. Like I want to hold on to it. Yeah. And my plans are to continue adding you know, so maybe in two years I can come out with edition two and it will be another 200 terms on top of what I already have and, uh, you know, make little tweaks to the definitions that are in there right now. And yeah, it's, it's something that will hopefully continue giving to people over the years. Have you thought about turning it into a GitHub repo? Yes. I feel like that would be, that'd be pretty cool. Then you can get people like submitting pull requests to add terms and definitions and stuff like that. Yeah, that's, that's, I didn't actually think about it in terms of that. I thought about just open sourcing it, you know, on GitHub. So, yeah. Yeah. V2 should be GitHub. Let's go. All right. Well, you guys, that's enough of us. Let's talk about all the craziness that happened. One of the Fed's biggest conferences uh, happens in Jackson Hole every year. This year, of course, it was a virtual Jackson Hole conference, but Powell gave a speech, a lot of different folks uh, that are really high up in just the Fed and, you know, what is happening with uh, US, doll U.S. monetary policy uh, participated in this. So really a big event. Ansel, why don't you give us the skinny? Yeah, so am I m muted? No. So, uh, yeah, this was um, the big annual Jackson Hole. The, it's, it's not only central bankers, it's also politicians uh, from the U.S. and internationally. I think it's about two, uh, maybe half bankers, 25% U.S. politicians, and then 25% international politicians and bankers and stuff. So it's a very big, big uh, summit there in Wyoming. But uh, a lot of times people don't read the fine print, and that's why we're here. We're here to read the fine print and give it to the people. Because uh, you guys have probably heard the outcome of this speech by Powell was that they're going to target inflation, an average inflation rate of 2%. That means that they'll let it run hot, quote unquote, let it run hot uh, for a year or two, whatever, just to pull up this average to 2% because it consistently runs below 2%. Um, but 
there's a lot and to the fine print. Not yeah. to not to interrupt, but you and other experts like Jeff Snyder, who came on the recent most recent show of Fed Watch, have been talking about the Fed can't even create inflation. It's uh, you know there's a reason why it's been under two percent. Oh yeah, and we get into some of that. the 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 Fed and Powell make some admissions in this speech that I think you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit to see what they're admitting. So uh, let's jump into it. I, I include the link to the PDF in the show notes. Should I share my screen now? What do you think? Yeah, go for it. So this, this is just um, the BIS website where you can find the, the PDF. And again, this will be all on, in the show notes for you guys. But let's scroll up here. Uh, this is the transcript of his speech. And the main point of this is this uh, average inflation targeting is the result of oh, two years of Fed, uh, like an internal Fed audit, where they look at their their policy you zoom framework. zoom in a little bit? Sorry. Zoom in, yeah. They look at their policy framework and they, um, uh, you know, uh, see how successful they have been and if they need to update anything. Um, they these consensus statements. Uh, Yellen did one in 2012, and now Powell is doing one. But before that, I don't even know if they'd done one for 50 years before that. Um, so these are relatively new things. But it's kind of like how they interpret their dual mandate, and how are they? What are their policy guidelines of the way? How are they going to get to this mandate or fulfill the mandate? Uh, okay. So the sections here. The first one is talking about the evolution of the Fed and their monetary, monetary policy. And I thought this was pretty interesting. So 40 years ago, the biggest problem our economy faced was high and rising inflation. The great inflation demanded a clear focus on restoring the credibility of the FOMC's commitment to price stability. Uh, Chair Paul Volcker brought the focus to bear and the Volcker disinflation with the continuing stewardship of Alan Greenspan led to the stabilization of inflation and inflation expectations in the 1990s at 2%. The Skipping forward here. Before the great moderation, expansions typically ended in overheating and rising inflation. Since then, prior to the current pandemic-induced downturn, a series of historically long expansions had been more likely to end with episodes of financial instability, promoting essential efforts to substantially increase the strength and resilience of the financial system. So what, just to kind of put that in layman's terms, before roughly 1980, 1987, these periods of expansion ended in inflation. So you had growth in the economy that led to inflation and then a, then a deflationary kind of reset. Now we have the opposite that we're supposed to somehow prime the pump with this QE to get growth. Uh, so th he's, he's saying that this is completely different pre Volcker and post Volcker, how we, how these um, episodes end. So do you have anything to add here, Christian? You stop sharing your screen. Um, you know, honestly, like it, it makes sense. And uh, I thought it's interesting to like hear about the history. Like in the 80s, when Paul Vol Volcker really raised interest rates, it was because, and Stacy talked about this, it was because, you know, he needed to show that the Fed was willing to defend the dollar and to keep it as a top dog. But that's not an issue really anymore. So like defending the dollar from inflation, they're right. It's It's not necessarily the issue because there's actually a dollar shortage as we've talked about a lot. And now they, the actual issues they need to create inflation because the world really needs some more dollars as Jeff Schneider said really well on our podcast. Uh, so it's just interesting to see how they're figuring it out. And it really goes to show what you've been saying is that they don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. And uh, I'm always jealous. I was talking to my father-in-law probably a couple months ago now and I was saying, you know, it's different today than it was in the 80s when he was my age. Um, because like in the 80s, they still had growth of 5 to 8%. Can you imagine? That's like China over the last 10 years. They've been around 8% growth. It's, and it's been gangbusters. Imagine growing up or coming of age in America with 8% growth. It's a totally different story than it is today. Uh, you can tell just uh, 
living in the economy, but looking out there at the economy and uh, seeing that people are very despondent because the growth is so damn low. It's completely yeah, I mean, different than it is. Look in the at 80s. millennials. It's yep. depressing. Millennials, depressing. Uh, they can't own homes. They can't ever make enough money to, uh, you know, get financial freedom. Uh, it's really sad. But so Bitcoin have- seems like the opportunity, right? It still yeah. is. Like it really is going to be the biggest wealth transfer event in, in history. Yeah, I, I believe so. But that's, that's just to say the the growth different then than now. Uh, you can see how growth would cause inflation. Okay, that's with a credit-based dollar growth. We need growth to cause inflation. And now the Fed is saying, well, look, since since that time, these long expansions haven't ended in inflation. Uh, so it's it's different now. Anyways, let's let's move on. I, sh- I need to share my screen again here. Okay, so then the next section gets into the motivation for this review. Again, this is a two-year process, the end of a two-year process. Um, and they have four key economic developments that they've noted. Um, the first one is just the estimate of potential growth has fallen and growth has fallen and remains stubbornly low. Even the Fed FOMC participants say that, uh, you know, they're like, consensus view has gone from 2.5% growth down to 1.8% growth. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's no growth in the economy. The second key development they say is that, um, so they have this R star, which is the natural rate of uh, interest in the economy. So if there was no central planning, the interest rate would be X, right? Or R star. And they're saying that this is, they're admitting right here, this rate is not affected by monetary policy, but instead is driven by fundamental factors in the economy, including demographics and productivity growth, the same factors that drive potential economic growth. Uh, this is the first time, at least I have noticed, that they are saying that their monetary policy does not affect the natural rate of interest out there in the economy. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, that's extremely interesting, right? Like they're pretty much saying that the fed put is not real and the fed put is all they have going for them. Right. That the fed funds rate does not necessarily translate into the wider economy. So um, pretty astonishing, you know, admission right there. Like that shows that they don't even know what is the driver of their power. Right. And then also they mentioned demographics and productivity growth as if they are, uh, independent variables. And I see, I think that demographics and productivity growth are a function of the monetary system. So of course, if, if you have very high debt, uh, like household debt or debt per capita out there, uh, people's time preferences are very high. And so they can't plan for the future very well. So kids are less of a concern for them or they, you know, maybe they think they can't afford kids because they're under all this debt burden. So the, the monetary policy or the monetary system, the form of money that we have affects demographics. And it also affects productivity growth because, you know, if you have a high time preference, you're not going to be investing long-term for growth. You're going to be investing short-term buying stocks or, you know, instead of buying back your stocks, instead of um, investing in expanding production, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like in, just to kind of add on like long-term thinking versus short-term thinking, it's been very interesting watching Apple throughout the years, just stash pile cash. Like obviously they're super yeah. relevant and they're making tons of money, but like, why are they not reinvesting it? Um, and when they do, obviously they, they buy, I'm, I'm confident that they buy back a decent amount of stock, just like every other corporation. So um, it's just, it, it's weird to see like the incentives play out and it's even weirder to see like the quote unquote architects of this system and like the rules not even understand the incentives. And it's just like confirmed every day. And again, people like you, people like Parker Lewis, people like Jeff Snyder, like they, they're all been screaming at the top of, of your lungs that the, the Fed doesn't know what's up. Exactly. And I think they're starting to come to the realization, like, like we've been saying that there are some very su- surprising admissions 
in this speech. Uh, here's another one. So then when they're talking, uh, about, this is a, the fourth key development. Um, the third key de development was that there was a historically strong labor market, which was good. But then they take it to the fourth development is that that strong labor market did not trigger a significant rise in inflation. Inflation forecasts are typically pre predicated on estimates of the natural rate of unemployment or U star and of how much upward pressure on inflation arises when the unemployment rate falls relative to U star. As the unemployment rate moved lower and inflation remained muted, estimates of U star were revised down. Now, I just want to break this down a little bit. So they have this. Um, U star, which is supposed to be the natural rate of unemployment, anything over that would be inflationary. So if you have, let's say the natural rate of unemployment is 4%. If employment, unemployment gets down to 3%, that's supposed to be inflationary. Um, that's what they thought all along. That's what they had been going on, designing their policies around for years. And what they're saying right here is as uh, the unemployment rate kept going down, and they didn't see inflation, they just revised U star down. It's like all they did was fill in that part of the equation. They had this equation that had to be right. And instead of saying, well, this didn't work, they just changed the variable down. You know what I mean? So what do you think about that? It's just funny. Uh, That's crazy. I mean, again, I feel like I, I keep uh, bringing up Jeff Snyder, but uh, he... Um, he he brought up the point that gosh and now i'm blinking out on the point <laughs> god damn it um that they oh, no, yeah, he brought up the point about uh quantitative easing that if it was really mm -hmm. quantitative that they wouldn't have to do it multiple times and yet right. japan is on like what their 30th round of quantitative easing and we are what qe number five right yeah, yeah. this is in the next section here uh they kind of speaks to that uh, they don't they they use the term too low so they're talking about inflation okay and they say oh of course inflation is essential for a well functioning economy but if inflation is persistently too low it can pose serious risks to the economy but like like you were just saying jeff schneider so uh, it's supposed to be quantitative this is supposed to be data driven but then they use something like too low, which is not an objective level, right? That is like, oh, it just happened to be too low. And how do we know that? Well, because something bad happened. So it must have been too low. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense that what they're doing doesn't make any sense. Okay. And then in, in this part also, they say uh, inflation that runs below its desired level can lead to an unwelcome fall in longer term inflation expectations which in turn can pull actual inflation even lower, resulting in an adverse cycle of ever lower inflation and inflation expectations. And again, this is what I've been saying. This is what Jeff Schneider has been saying, that inflation expectations are the primary driver. They are what pull real inflation, quote unquote, real inflation, whatever that is, around. So, and again, this is a surprising admission by the Fed. Uh, it, to me, this says, 100%, they are worried about inflation expectations. That's it. I mean, again, I feel like it's really interesting that it goes from what we're doing might not really impact inflation and then saying that we need ex expectations of inflation to you know, remain in order for us to continue to have a healthy economy so like why are they admitting that they don't know it just doesn't make none of it makes sense anymore okay moving on to the next section here this is where they kind of outline their new consensus statement what their policy is going to be about uh, we talked about the unemployment we talked about the uh stable prices so they they uh, wrap it up here. They say specifying a numerical goal for unemployment is unwise because maximum level of unemployment is not directly measurable and changes over time for reasons unrelated to monetary policy. So this, they're saying they don't have that level of full employment anymore where if it got too, 
if it got to, if unemployment got too low, right? Uh, under say 4% or 5% unemployment, they're supposed to be inflationary, but they can't identify that. They can't measure it directly. So they're just going to kind of get rid of that whole thing. And um, just, it's, it's kind of one-sided. So they're, okay, um, <laughs> it's hard to explain, but they're, you know how their inflation was, their inflation goals were symmetric. So if it's below 2%, they're supposed to try to push it up. And if it's above 2%, they're supposed to try to push it down. So there's symmetry there to their policy. It was the same with unemployment. They're supposed to target this specific maximum employment level that if it was too low or too high, they would try to bring it back in line with that. But now they're just saying, we're getting rid of that level. Uh, we're just trying to target full employment. And I don't know, even know how they will do that. But moving on to the next thing, this is about their inflation. They, they didn't change anything. They're still targeting 2%. And finally, they just say that mon their monetary policy has to be forward looking. And I think that has to do with, you know, the inflation expectations. So, the, um, so I want to talk about this idea of full employment because okay. really, it's hard to explain. Like, I mean, what it means to me and like, tell me if I'm, if I'm off here, but the idea of full employment is that every working able person should be working. Right. And what, and I understand why on the surface that seems like it's a good idea, but ultimately what it means is that you don't have the right to not work. You don't have the right to not produce, or you don't have the right to control your time. And that the Fed is going to implement policy in order to ensure that that is the case. Um, and, and honestly, like that idea seems rather Orwellian to me in general. Like the idea of full employment is really kind of an effed up idea. Like, mm -hmm. first of all, these people don't know what the hell is good for the economy. Second of all, now they're defining what everyone should be doing and then implementing policy in order to achieve it. It just, it makes no sense to me. And, and it's, it, it almost seems like, you know, <laughs> despotic. Yeah. And what's to say, you know, I, uh, the labor force participation rate. So um, a lot, long time ago, say in the sixties, fifties and sixties, it was just men. And now it's includes women. Right. And so you, the employment rate, what is the natural employment or the uh, full employment? If, most people want to have families and they want one of the, the spouses to stay home with the kids. It does. If the mom wants to stay home, is she now unemployed? Is she part of the full employment? And, you know, it's, it just brings up a whole bag of worms when you try to target something like that. Yeah. I mean, we, I think we can move on, but I just, I have strong feelings about that idea because I, I, I talk to friends that, you know, aren't, you know, they haven't bought into this idea of like, complete free markets and Austrian economics. Uh, and they think, you know, we need full employment as if it's a good thing, but like really what, like, again, that's just centralized decision-making for a massive group of people. And uh, I mean, I think you can point to a lot of negative results, uh, depression and people not creating families, short-term thinking. Uh, just even look at Japan, like people aren't happy. They aren't having kids. Like they're messing up their society. Absolutely. And, and the Fed says it's not measurable anyway. Like the full employment rate that well, whatever rate it should be is not measurable. And Powell admits it in the speech. So we have one more thing to wrap up here. Uh, this is the last, the last section, kind of the whole point of the entire speech is to just introduce this inflation, average inflation targeting. So I'll read this uh, section here. Um, if inflation runs below 2% following economic downturns, downturns, but never moves above 2%, even when the economy is strong, then over time, inflation will average less than 2%. Households and businesses will come to expect this result, meaning that inflation expectations would tend to move below our inflation goal and pull realized inflation down. To prevent this outcome and the adverse dynamics that could ensue, our new statement indicates that we will seek to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. 
Therefore, following periods when inflation has been running below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. And that is the whole, whole point of the speech. So what do you think? I do find that it's interesting, like them starting to admit that they're wearing no clothes. And one of the things that skeptics say about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin's too volatile. And in reality, if you zoom out, Bitcoin's actually extremely consistent and the volatility just happens on the short term. And when you look at their new strategy, they're essentially admitting that perfect short-term stability is not possible. They must, you know, have increased uh, yeah. inflation now because it was too low earlier and we need to average it out. So now they're working towards an average over time. And I mean, they're kind of coming more in line to how Bitcoin works, which is, you know, there is going to be short-term volatility, but long-term it's going to average out. Um, I don't think the Fed is mm. going to achieve Bitcoin's results because <laughs> they haven't quite admitted that there is no right monetary policy, but um, they're, they're, they're slowly, slowly waking up to the reality of how the world works. And it like short term stability is just like, it's not actually a real thing. Right. And yeah, that's not how markets work. Markets can't be controlled precisely. So, uh, you have to let it be uh, a little bit overshooting and a little bit undershooting. Yeah. That's a great way to Bitcoin is kind of maybe influencing the way these people are thinking from a subconscious level. Is that what you're saying? Well, Bitcoin's real. And yeah. the Fed policy is obviously a fantasy. So they ha they're trying to adjust their Fed policy back a little bit to reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, as you're talking there too, I was thinking that this was a hard fork. This is a hard fork of the dollar basically, uh, which is an interesting way to think about it. Sure. Right. You know, they can hard fork whenever they want to. Yeah. Um, I mean, they do it pretty regularly. Would you consider any of the stuff that happened in the face of COVID as being a quote unquote hard fork? I think that, you know, they changed a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all, all every time that they raise or lower the fed funds, the target rate for the fed funds, uh, that, that would be considered a hard fork as well. But, uh, okay. Should we move on to the ECB? <laughs> Yeah, this bonus episode is getting to be... Uh, it's getting long, dude. We're, we're getting everyone their money's worth, that's for sure. <laughs> um, that's yeah, let's, let's talk about the ECB, the, uh, <laughs> the other incompetent central bank. This will be quick here, this one. So again, for YouTube folks, I'm sharing my screen so you can see exactly the article that I'm looking at. And this is just from Reuters from yesterday or two days ago. And the Eurozone is complaining about inflation. The headline is, Europe's inflation plunges to raise red flags at ECB. Sorry, I'll have to redo that. <laughs> the lack of inflation is what's raising the, the red flags. And the headline is, Europe's inflation plunge to raise red flags at ECB. Eurozone inflation turned negative last month for the first time since May of 2016, raising chances that the ECB will have to inject yet more uh, stimulus to generate price growth, which has undershot its target for over seven years. Uh, going down here, there's a quote. This is from some wealth, <laughs> I don't, can't pronounce his name, uh, wealth management strategies uh, strategist. There is no escaping this deflationary effect of the, of the crisis, at least over the coming quarters. We stick with our view that the ECB will ultimately increase the pandemic emergency purchase program envelope again, which likely, most likely by 500 billion euros in December. So that's pretty much it. What do you have to say about this? Yeah. I struggled through that. I know. Uh, but you got it. You got the gist, right? I did. And I mean, all these central banks are in the same boat and COVID really did a number on them because it exposed their inability to create inflation and it attacked the monetary system where it is weakest, right? Like it created real deflation in the economy 
And yet all these prices are pumped up and all these people have X salaries and all these people have X mortgages locked in. And that deflationary spiral, it just, they, none of these central banks can handle it. And it's, it's hilarious that this entire time they're fighting inflation and then they were just stacking their deck in a, in a position where deflation would kill them. Right. And it just shows that they have yeah. no idea what they're doing. And they, you know, by, by, being so scared of inflation and trying to fight inflation, um, they've put themselves in a position where a black swan in the deflationary direction uh, just absolutely is is crushing them. It, it, it's it's hilarious. Yeah, and look at the ECB specifically. Is um, they have never stopped QE, and now they did this huge trillion euro rescue package where they just flooded all of this. Uh, they're supposed to be flooding money into the economy and what do they have their first deflationary quarter is since 2016 so it just doesn't work whatever they're doing they're calling it printing money which they obviously are not printing money but whatever they're doing it is not working and it's just hilarious well i mean debt is being destroyed really in areas that they can't fully understand or calculate. And then they are uh, redistributing, recreating that money and then redistributing it in ways that don't actually get the money to where it needs to be because they can't, they can't, no one can. All of these uh, stimulus distribution systems are flawed and they just, you know, debt is being destroyed everywhere and therefore money is, you know, the, the system is deflating and they can't get the stimulus to replace it anywhere, you know, in the right places. Uh, and I mean, again, we've been talking about this the whole time and it's just showing itself every single day. Yep. And that's, that's all I got. Do you have anything else to, for this quick, that's supposed to be a quick episode, but. Well, do you want to talk about Bitcoin? Uh, would love to yeah, do a little do bit of Ansel TA on this. Uh, maybe this is a YouTube only just because it's so visual, but uh, we'll probably just put it out on both. Okay. Yeah, let me share the screen again. So um, basically, we had that breakout at the end of July, and we had been consolidating in uh, some sort of pattern. Uh, I kind of identified this that might have been a head and shoulders right here that breaks down. I also identified like a 10.4 as a target for this uh, rising or ascending wedge that broke down. Uh, so kind of expecting this to, to reset a little bit, but man, I don't know. It is, do you think Bitcoin could be signaling the start of a next sell-off in say stocks or the, the broader traditional market? Because they well, dropped today, pretty heavily. Today, today sold too. off today. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, and if you look macro, this is a point of uncertainty. Uh, we've already discussed how stimulus is bullish and uh, stimulus may be ending, you know, with political gridlock right now. So it makes sense that this is when it deflates again. Uh, I think stimulus will ultimately come. Bitcoin Tina has been saying this. Stocks going down is bullish for Bitcoin because that means uh, uh, lawmakers are going to drop their pants and stimu uh, stimulate. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> so <laughs> that's good for Bitcoin. Uh, but yeah, this... This makes sense. And, you know, no financial advice, but uh, I may be holding and waiting for a dip for stocks and Bitcoin personally. Yeah. And well, I don't think that Bitcoin is going to fall very far. Uh, um, I think it's pretty strong. There, there is a CME gap that's around, I think, like 9,700 or something. It could drop down there to fill that. But uh, I think this, this time around, Bitcoin is going to prove to be much more stable. Um, all the weak hands were flushed out in March and everyone's ready for a bull market. Now, what, uh, one thing that does scare me too is the altcoin, altcoin bubble. It's already so high. I mean, what are all these food tokens that have been launched over the last couple of weeks that go into $30,000, $40,000 per coin and then back to zero within a matter of a few days? It is extremely frothy and overbought over there on the altcoin side. And oh, yeah. if this... If the, the stock market, traditional stock market, if it goes risk off, altcoins could go risk off and it could be a 
put more pressure down on the Bitcoin price. So um, yes, I, I think Bitcoin is going to be much more stable than in March, but there is a possibility that we we drop significantly, pulled down by altcoins and by uh, a risk off in the economy. Well, I would say that you know we are rediscovering the hodler floor because a lot of new entrants came in. There's been a lot of bullishness, like Bitcoin moved to 12K in, I mean, if you discount like six weeks in 2017, this is really the all-time high. So like mm -hmm. Bitcoin was testing its real all-time highs. Um, and well, you know, and, and it's all-time highs versus most other currencies. Oh yeah, that's true as well. So, um, I mean, it makes sense that there's a little bit of a sell-off. I, I would say zoom out, put things into perspective and, uh, you know, just keep holding the, the end game in the short term is probably 2021, 2022 timeframe. So, you know, this is, <laughs> you know, this is just volatility on the way to that. Yeah. Listeners shouldn't think of Bitcoin as a get rich quick scheme. It's a thing that you hold. It changes you fundamentally, um, you know, from your work ethic to your time preference and that's holding it is just healthy. Yeah. 100%. And honestly, like all coins keep you up at night. Bitcoin helps you sleep at night. Seriously. All right, man. Great show, I think.